Do you ever wonder about words and their meanings? I do sometimes. Clichés are one of my favorites. The standard definition in most dictionaries is a phrase whose meaning has been dulled by repetition. In my case, the cliché was a cheating spouse. I know, I know, the cliché of cliché. It's such a common occurrence in marriages that there seems to be an entire section of the court system devoted to it. But even that has become a cliché. It's no longer a rare event that allows the system to grow tired of repeating irreconcilable differences and no fault more and more often. So what? Big deal. It happened, now accept it or not. It doesn't matter to the system. Deal with it. This is the age of no blame. Unless it's happening to you. And it's always someone else's fault. Another word I find interesting is rat shot. Rat shot is a type of ammunition, usually .22 caliber, but available for a variety of guns. It is essentially a miniature shotgun shell with a few tiny balls of lead in it. Not lethal unless you're a rat. I discovered rat shot when I was 12. We lived a half mile from the county dump, a mecca for scavengers, especially rats and vultures. Conditions were perfect for a rat population explosion that year. I had an old single shot 22 shotgun and my father bought me two boxes of rat shot. Cut them down, boy. They're starting to make their way into the chicken feed. My 10-year-old brother and I had a hearty laugh. Dad had to buy us two more boxes of ammo. We had pretty much wiped out the rat population around the house, so we ventured farther afield. We were in a field near the dump and shot the rats as fast as we could reload. They were huge suckers, weighing a pound or more. I just reloaded the rifle and handed it to my brother. I stepped back. We were savvy enough not to get shot at. At that moment, what must have been a king rat jumped out of the shrubbery at my feet. Look, Jimmy, I shouted. Get him. Jimmy took my advice, but not before I was sure of it. He caught the rat, but in doing so put two pellets in my ankle. I discovered two disturbing truths that day. I do not love pain and tend to react poorly to being hurt. I also discovered that I have a terrible temper because when I realized what I was doing, my brother was on the ground screaming and crying, and I was screaming and cursing. I calmed my brother down, apologized, and we agreed to never talk about it. For one thing, we were both afraid of what our father might do, and at the very least, he would never let us near firearms again. So we told mom that I had scraped my ankle on a wire fence. I think the pellets melted over time, but who knows, maybe they're still in my ankle. My temper came out a few times during my high school years. It soon became common knowledge that I wasn't worth getting turned on because I didn't know when to lash out. Although I weighed only 5, 7, and 140 pounds for most of high school, no one really pushed me much. The last growth spurt came in my senior year of high school when I grew to 5'10 and 170 pounds. I went to college on a scholarship, got a degree in accounting and inventory control, and made a noble and a few good friends. I had a roommate from a moderately successful family for the last three years, and he taught me a lot about manners and social graces. I taught him not to take crap from anyone, ever. I think what I taught him helped him become a really good trial lawyer. I met my future wife at one of the parties his family threw. Although we hadn't actually met in a few years, she went to the West Coast and I stayed put. It was four years after high school graduation. We were celebrating Ron passing the bar exam. I hadn't seen many of the guests since graduation, so there was a lot of talk about what happened to this and that. I asked one of our former classmates about Jenny. Man, that woman was hot. She's probably already married to some CEO, sunbathing by the country club pool and polishing her jewelry. Or maybe she's already a CEO and paying someone to polish her jewelry. Scotty and Ron stood there grinning like idiots. I immediately realized I'd said something wrong. What, from the way you're looking at me, she's standing right behind me? I looked at Ron, who was trying to keep a straight face. Then I realized. Hey, Jenny, I said without turning around. Give me a second while I get this foot out of my mouth. Turning around, I saw her pull her hand away from her mouth, and Ron and Scotty burst into laughter. I picked her up in my arms and swirled her around me. Damn, you even smell as good as you used to. Back for a visit? She stopped smiling. No, I moved back home. Things didn't work out as well on the West Coast as I expected. I hugged her. It's their loss. Welcome back. We chatted for a few minutes before one of her girlfriends led her away. I looked at Ron. 
What happened? He shrugged. I don't know any details. Mom said she got married but came back alone. No rings. I'm sure she'll tell us if she wants to. I was just leaving, making my rounds and saying my goodbyes, when Jenny came up to me. Since you're leaving, could you give me a ride home? I live at my mom's and I know we're on the way. I smiled. A little alone time with a beautiful girl? It would do wonders for my mood. Sure. Do you need a moment to let those you came with know? Her frown spoke volumes. Yeah, if I could find her. Sarah left with Scotty a few minutes ago. We probably won't see her for the next two days. I frowned, but for a different reason. She'd noticed. In the car, she'd asked about it. Sarah was the whore of the group, just like any other group. And Scott was the horn dog. Married, engaged, single, underage, he never missed an opportunity to nail a girl and brag about it afterward. I barely tolerated him in high school. My attitude towards Scotty softened a bit after he got married. And Sarah? Well, she was just Sarah. She was always up for a good time. She got married right out of high school to a pretty nice guy. He had a job that required traveling, with only a sleepover every two or three weeks. She lasted a year before she started seeing girls while he wasn't home. After three months, she was already sleeping with everyone. He caught her and she didn't fight the divorce. I kept in touch with her for about six months after the breakup, asking her out on dates. There was no spark, we were just two old friends at dinner. She asked about my love life, I was the last of the group still single. I told her that when I found the right girl, I'd settle down and become just another boring suburban husband, worrying about the mortgage and getting the kids braces. She laughed when I asked about her personal life. I'm a party girl, Sam. I have lots of lovers, but no boyfriends. I've experienced firsthand that I'm not fit to be a wife. I caused Harry a lot of pain, and I still regret it. Next time, I'll only get into a serious relationship when I'm sure I'll never betray him. And I mean when I'm really sure. Not just when I think I'm sure. That's why you and I will never sleep in the same bed. You're the most serious of us all, and if we slept together, it would have to mean something to you. That's my curse. I've heard the stories, and I'd love to test your mattress for strength. But I can't because you're my only male friend. And oddly enough, I've always had feelings for you. Does any of this make any sense? It does. I understood her. She'd always been my best friend after Jenny. I wasn't going to let sex ruin our friendship. But even if it was Scotty, she knew he was married. Jenny smiled. Don't be too hard on her, Sam. She was very horny, and you know how quickly Scotty will take advantage of that. I'm sure she'll reprimand him tomorrow. I'm a little worried about her. I mentally flagged that I would talk to Sarah at the first opportunity. I tried to change the subject. What's up, Jen? Are you back for good or just visiting? You know everyone's talking and they've noticed you're not wearing any rings. She was quiet for a minute, looking at the night sky passing outside the window. It wasn't love at first sight, more like lust. We slept together on the first date, moved in together three months later, married four months later. We were right for each other, at least for a while. Then the cracks appeared. He liked to party more than I did. I wanted kids, which we didn't talk about. He made it clear that if we had kids, he only wanted one and wanted to wait at least eight years so we could bond. He liked buying things, but didn't like paying the bills. It all came down to the fact that I had committed myself to an immature boy, not a man. When I started telling him no, we grew distant from each other. One day he just walked away. I'm ashamed to say, but I was glad he did. My good job went the way of the economy. Without a job and a husband, there was no point in staying. So I came back home. End of story. I didn't know what to say. I'm sorry your life didn't work out the way you planned, but I'm glad you came back. It got to the point where if I wanted to talk about something intelligent, I had to go to Ron's parents' house. Even there, all they talk about is laws. On the plus side, I'm not a bad lay lawyer. She smiled. Everyone knew not to wind us up. We had an opinion on everything, usually the exact opposite. Our arguments could go on for days. Rarely did either of us win. She smiled, then looked at me seriously. Sammy, how come we've never met? It was a fair question considering the time we'd spent together. I guess I was thinking about you too much. Sex has a way of ruining everything, especially at that age. 
Look at how many of our friends dated, broke up, and then hated each other for months and tried to get us to choose sides. I didn't want to go through that shit and lose you. She looked at me that way. You know the one I'm talking about. The one that says, you're not going to like this, while she continues to talk you into whatever it is. We men know there are no defenses in the world you can't use. You can't win. The best you can hope for is a reprieve. Well, we got older and I had to get wiser. So next Friday night, pick me up at 7. Take me to a really nice restaurant, get me drunk on wine, have dinner with me, ask me to dance. I haven't been out like this in ages. I couldn't think of a better man for me than you. I know you won't take advantage of that. I wish I could say the same thing, but it's been a long time, and I can just get you drunk and possess you. By then, we had pulled up to her house. Giggling at the expression on my face, she got out of the car, walked over, leaned over to my window, and gave me a long kiss. Pulling back, she grinned. That's enough for you until next Friday. Don't call me. Let the anticipation build. Good night, Sammy. All week, I'd been struggling with my reaction. Some part of me, a very small part, wanted me to stay away. Another part said to show up and keep my distance, as if it were an obligation or a favor. The biggest part of me was saying, Fool, you've been given a gift. Enjoy it. And I did. We had a great time. Danced till three. Spent 40 minutes in the car, steaming the windows and letting my hands run wild. Fondled her with my fingers, worked her with my hands. We laughed because we were acting like a couple of teenagers. We had two more dates and lunch with her mom. I started to feel comfortable with her again. The argument started just like they used to. I started taking her much more seriously. The next weekend, we didn't go out. I had a commitment that had me out of town. She looked disgruntled. Those plans don't include another woman, do they? I laughed. Yes, as a matter of fact, it does. I'm going to was all I managed to say before she hung up on me. It was weird. I left and took care of some things I needed to do and didn't get back until Tuesday. Not an hour later, the phone rang at home. An icy voice came on the line. Needed an extra day? The weekend wasn't enough? I think you should... I hung up, seriously wondering about her sanity. I didn't speak to her for three days. Then out of the blue, I got a call from Ron's girlfriend. I was surprised. We weren't particularly close. What's up with you and Jenny? Hi, Becca. How's Ron? Is the wedding planner getting on your nerves yet? Oh, I don't have any business with Jenny. Tell Ron I said hi. Poor Ron. I bet he's already got his ears on. Sure enough, he called 40 minutes later, practically begging me to meet him for a drink. I met him and Scotty at our favorite diner. Scotty knew how I felt about what he had done to his wife and kept quiet. Before he could begin, I interrupted him. If this is fishing for Jenny, don't bother wetting your hook. We've met three times, I have to go out of town, and she has a fatal attraction all the time. I don't know her mindset, but I haven't made any promises to her. I wasn't even given a chance to talk to her like a reasonable person. End of discussion. Talk about her one more time and I'll leave. I had ruined their game plan and they didn't know what to say. I walked away. Another month passed, and it was time for the rehearsal dinner. I wasn't Ron's best man, but I was the groom's best man. Jenny was a late bridesmaid. I saw her, but didn't approach her. Sarah grabbed me as soon as she saw me. Stay close to me today, please. Scotty is here, and he's already drinking. I'm not interested in a repeat performance. His love skills are lacking, if you know what I mean, and I have a pretty good base of comparison. His biggest asset is the size of his bragging rights. That's probably why his wife left him. Pick me up tonight, stud. Protect the fair maiden from unwanted advances. I'll be very grateful. She giggled as I held out my hand to her. We both knew nothing was going to happen. Too bad, Scotty, she said. The count keeps changing. At last count, Scotty joined Jenny in the ranks of the previously married. Only you and Ron remain unmarried, with Ron on the short list, and that leaves only you. A lot of girls who have recently become unmarried have you in their sights. She frowned, hesitating. Tell me, didn't you and Jenny go out when she first came back? What happened there? My turn to frown. I don't. We went out three times, and I thought we got along great, and then I had to go out of town. When I came back, she was a completely different person and acted like I owed her an apology. I think she decided I had found someone better and turned into a bitch. 
I haven't spoken to her in a month. Where did you disappear to? I laughed. Sarah, honey, don't make me put on my bud hat and pull out my red man. You know where I go once a month? My old man was a factory worker and part-time farmer. He had 50 acres of land that he inherited from his grandfather. Because of his job and the farm, my mom didn't have to work and we lived well. He raised three children and if we didn't always get what we wanted, we always got what we needed. He taught us early on that if we wanted something, to go out and earn it, not wait for someone to give it to you. It was a lesson I appreciated all the more the older I got. We were grown now. Jimmy was 17 when my mom died when a train derailed at a crossing. Mom wasn't even first in line. The coal car flipped over onto four cars waiting to cross. It almost killed my dad. He lay down for almost a year. Jimmy graduated from high school and joined the Navy. He read that single people often live fuller lives if they have someone to take care of them, so he bought a blue tick hound puppy from a friend. Dad immediately fell in love with the puppy. He became passionate about coon hunting. Taking some of the insurance money, he built several kennels and began breeding raccoons. He learned how to train and coach them. He spent many weekend evenings perfecting his methods. I could have been knocked over with a feather when he called and asked me to help him buy a computer. By then, I had graduated from university and had a decent job. I asked a friend in IT to put together a nice kit for him, took him home, hooked everything up, gave him some basic lessons, and showed him how to use email. By the time I left in the afternoon, he was already writing with two fingers, enjoying himself. Following his belief that if you're going to do something, do it the best you can, he enrolled in community college and took a course. Soon he had his own website. His reputation was enhanced when two of his dogs were named grand champions in different classes that same year. I was shocked to learn how valuable these dogs were and how much money he was making. He retired from factory farming, did a little farming, and concentrated on raising his champions. To become a grand champion, you start at the local level, move up to district, then state, then region, then national level. To qualify for all of that, you have to go through trials. My dad was doing well until one night during trials he tripped and broke his leg in two places. The leg healed but couldn't take the night hunting or the stress of the competition. That's where Jimmy and I came to the rescue. He trained the dogs and we handled them at the trials. During the spring and summer pre-trials, Jimmy would do them one weekend, and two weeks later, it was me on the line. At nationals, Jimmy and I both attended and took turns running the dogs. There was a lot of shenanigans, dog trading, and drinking, but we left that to the old man. Sarah, upon hearing about it, thought the whole thing was hilarious and insisted on coming. She was treated once. It was all about dogs, dogs, and everything to do with them. There was no nightlife because all the time was spent in the woods with the dogs. The women there usually looked the same as the men, in jeans and caps. In two days, she almost screamed with boredom. She almost slept with one of the judges. She said he looked the cleanest, just to have something to do. When we got home, she kissed me, told me never again, and went off to have her own version of a hunt. I feel sorry for the one she caught. Are you still doing this shit? Yes, Sarah, but we're training one of my sister's boys, so in a year or so I'll be able to stop. Dad has three champion bitches he breeds, and one champion male that covers 25 bitches a year. Dad makes more money than I do. Sarah looked odd, probably thinking about being covered 25 times. So who was that bitch, and I mean that literally, that you were out with that weekend when Jenny went crazy? Her name is Amanda Lee, the fourth one. He likes to name them after my mom. I wonder if she'd let him if she were alive. My dad became her drinking buddy the weekend she traveled with me. I think she would have let him. Do you know he still shows pictures of her at tryouts? A glint appeared in her eyes that meant trouble. Say, do you have pictures of your father's dogs? I had a magazine where I was pictured with two of them. Both were grand champions in their classes, with my handler and dad's owner and trainer listed, along with the dates. Dad sent it to me that day. Most of my friends wouldn't have recognized me. I was wearing Carhartts, a cap with his kennel logo and a two-day beard. I told her about it. She was still in my car. Kitty, she said, holding out her hand. Sarah, you're not going to do anything embarrassing, are you? Not for you, no, but I'm going to make sure Jenny sees it so she knows. I tried to talk her out of it, but let her do it at the end, just so I could hear what Jenny had to say. She took her time, waiting for the right moment. Jenny, Sarah, and a few other wives and girlfriends huddled around, 
discussing the wedding, their weddings, their husbands, boyfriends, and so on. Girl talk. At just the right moment, Sarah dropped a bombshell. Jenny, are you still seeing Sammy? She replied, and her face tensed for a second. No, it's over. I thought things were going well when he went out of town to another woman. My ex can attest that I'm not much for sharing. Wow, I didn't know you guys were serious. But you're right, I remember that weekend. It wasn't just one woman, but two, and he went out with them all night twice. I even have pictures. She pulled out the magazine. She memorized the page by heart and showed it to the girls. Afterwards, she said she wished she had a camera, not just for Jenny, but for the whole group. Most of them had never seen me in a suit or casual dress. I rarely wore jeans, only if I was at home. The magazine spread around the room and that's when the joke started. One of my bridesmaids asked if it was true that I really knew how to handle bitches. Sure, keep them on a short leash and shake the shit out of them every now and then, and they usually do what you tell them to do. Need lessons? She ran off, squealing with laughter. The guys were even funnier. Everyone had something to say except Jenny. She wouldn't even look me in the eye. Whether by luck or female intrigue, I was set up with Jenny at the wedding. During the reception, I kept the conversation light and pleasant. I looked around the room. With the exception of maybe Sarah, Jenny was the most beautiful woman in the room. We were doing a slow dance when she pulled back to look me in the eye. Say it. What, Jen? That I'm a psychotic bitch with poor social skills and very little brain. I stopped in the middle of the floor. Why would I tell you such hurtful things? Honestly, I'm afraid to say anything to you. I don't know how you'll react. Right now I like the feel of you snuggling up to me. Can we finish the dance without talking? She pulled herself to me so hard I thought she was trying to walk through me. Yeah, but we'll talk tomorrow. I'll call you. She didn't call, but showed up at my house the next afternoon. Got any wine? She asked, walking past me as I opened the door. I watched as she made herself comfortable on my couch. She looked around. Why would a bachelor need a three-bedroom house? I pulled out a bottle of my favorite wine and rummaged through the silverware looking for a corkscrew. I don't plan on being a bachelor forever. I think I'll need those bedrooms someday. She smiled, accepting the glass. I forgot that you're like communists. You always have a five-year plan. I shrugged. Probably the best idea they ever had. I didn't say anything else. This was her show. Hear me out, please. I've had a hard time getting over my divorce. I even had to take pills, one to calm down and one to cheer me up. If I mixed them, my emotions were all over the place. I really like you, Sam, always have. It was great meeting you when I first came back. I've always harbored feelings for you. In my mind, you were perfect for me. When you said you had to go out of town and women came into play, I lost my head. It was like my ex-girlfriend. I should have let you finish when I called you. I should have called you back and apologized. But I didn't. I'm really sorry more than you know. I still want to be your friend. And just so you know, I'm done with the pills as it turns out. Surprise, surprise. They weren't a good mix. Stop groveling and expecting forgiveness. I looked at her. Wow, hooked on the pills. I always thought you were the most balanced person I knew. I can never tell, I guess. Give me a hug, you stoner. She didn't know whether to be offended or take it as a joke, but finally smiled and hugged me. Then we drifted apart, as always, arguing about the pros and cons of living in a society that has pills for every disease known to man and a few more for everything you can think of. It was a nice thing to do. She didn't ask about getting together again, and I didn't mention it. Two weeks had passed when she called me. The pill is here. Freeman Philbad Jr. and Sweet Tang are performing at a blues club this weekend. Do you want to go? I loved the blues and had read a lot of good things about this duo, so of course I went. After that, we started communicating. I would call her or she would call me, and we would spend most weekends together. On the weekends that I was gone, she'd go off somewhere and do girl stuff, I guess. I had lunch with Sarah and she purred. Now you can thank me. For what? For getting you and Jen back together. But I have a question. When are you going to break down and sleep with her? Hey. Sarah rolled her eyes. She's been waiting a long time for this, you idiot. 
I pondered this afternoon. We hadn't had any intimacy since we started dating again. The following Friday night, we went out for a light dinner and a movie. I brought her home instead of taking her to her mom's house. She was looking for an apartment but kept telling me she liked houses better. She just couldn't afford it right now. What are we doing here? I answered her honestly. The next morning, I woke up alone. She walked in with a cup of coffee wearing one of my shirts. Get up, sleepyhead. I made coffee. Smiling, I waddled into the kitchen. We had a friendly breakfast, cooking together. I went outside and gathered our discarded clothes, and Jen stood in the doorway giggling. She took my car and drove home and bought more clothes. We went to a movie and then messed around. She moved in with us almost immediately. Nine months later, we were married. Jen found a job she liked, but it didn't pay very well. I had a good job and had just moved up one rung on the food chain when we got together. I already had my own house. My father had given me money for the down payment from the insurance money. We weren't rich, but we lived quite comfortably, especially for a budding young couple. Jenny took over our house, remodeling it. We had a large backyard, and together we turned it into a beautiful sitting area. We laid paving stones, put in a table and benches, put in lighting, and built a gazebo. We painstakingly assembled a weather-resistant outdoor kitchen, grill with side burners, cabinets, mini-fridge, and sink. The centerpiece was a clay oven that a friend of mine built from local clay. Our pizza parties were a huge success. I was happy. She was happy. Life was good. For two years. I took Jenny Kuhn hunting with me once. She hated it. I told her why I was doing it and she said she understood. But in the last year or so, she started to resent it. The last time I went, she stood in the garage doorway trying to get me to stay. Are you really going to give that up so you don't have to sleep all night with some smelly dogs? Maybe I should look for someone else to keep her warm, someone who appreciates what I have to offer. Tell you what, why don't you do just that? Call Sarah, I'm sure she knows the best places to get laid. I'll leave the truck and get a car, then she'll help you move. Remember, this was my house first. Have a hell of a life, Jenny. She knew, absolutely knew, that I hated cheaters more than anything. It had been almost three years since Scotty and his wife had broken up, and it wasn't even about Sarah, and I could still barely stand him. Knowing that, she threw it in my face anyway. Tactical error. I grabbed my bag out of the truck, threw it in the car, and drove off before she could say anything back. Before I'd gone a block, my phone rang. I ignored it. I ignored it all the way to the hunt. Dad realized I was freaking out when he saw me, but prudently kept silent. I stroked and fiddled with the three dogs I was hunting, attaching GPS monitors to their collars. 21st century redneck gear. It was so much easier to find them and the way back. The first night, I chased all three of them away. The male got caught in the barbed wire fence and had to withdraw, but with the other two, I took first place in the class. The young female was the best I had ever run. That's what I told my father. He agreed. I think she'll be a champion for a long time. I think she's the best I've ever bred. When I got home, I was tired, dirty, and not in the best of moods. Sarah was still pissed, but was smart enough not to push her. I took a shower and plopped down on the bed for a nap. She let me sleep for five hours before she got me up. Dinner is ready. You need to get up or you won't get enough sleep and you'll feel like shit at work tomorrow. Dinner went pretty quietly. We cleaned up together and went into the living room. I looked for the remote and couldn't find it. Looking up, I saw her holding it in her hands. No TV until we talk. I apologize for what I said before you left. You should know that I'm not interested in anyone but you. With my new job, we don't have as much time together as we used to. And can you blame me for wanting to spend all the time we have together? Not at all. I miss our time together too. But you knew I had family commitments when we got married. They're due to end this year. Dad's thinking of making Jerry a full partner. It'll take the responsibility off Jimmy and me. I'll still go from time to time because I've learned to enjoy it. Is that really a problem? What made you think that? She raised her hands in a surrendering gesture. First of all, I hate my job. I didn't get my degree to run a specialty store in a mall. If you add up my hours, I'm barely above minimum wage. I hate having to work two nights a week and every weekend. I feel like I'm just spinning in place and in no hurry to get anywhere. I felt sorry for her, but she, like everyone else in the country, was doing the best she could in a bad economy. If it's stressing you out so much, quit. 
We can hold out until you find something else. Maybe you can move into a new line of work. Motherhood. We're almost 30. Time is ticking. It was an old conversation. We both wanted kids. We just wanted to be a little more financially stable. Jenny cried. I want our children. I just want to be able to give them the best. I do too, but maybe love is the best thing we can give them. Growing up, we didn't have a lot of money, but we had a lot of love. That was more than enough. In the end, we apologized to each other, but left the baby issue for later. The next two hunts I missed, Jimmy took one and Jerry the other and stayed home. Jenny seemed to appreciate it. She started going to bachelorette parties with her old friends, including Sarah. That first night, she came to pick her up. Damn, it's my turn to be the driver. Don't worry, Sam. I'll get her drunk on alcohol and ready for work when she gets home. Jenny blushed as Sarah narrated. But Sarah managed it. Jenny was well intoxicated and horny as hell when she got home. I barely made it to work the next day. Another cliche? The neighborhood stud. You know the guy. He usually has the biggest house on the block, or the prettiest wife he ignores at parties, the best job, or the car, etc. Our guy was James. Don't call me Jimmy. Mitchell. He didn't show up in the neighborhood for about a month. Jenny met his wife and invited them to our monthly BBQ. That evening, we made pizza. The clay oven could be preheated to 600 degrees, stick a pizza in there, and make it in five minutes. The smoke residue gave them extra flavor. Pizza night meant it was a party with the kids. We prepared the crusts ahead of time and had them waiting on a table piled high with ingredients. The kids enjoyed assembling their own pizzas. I stuck them in the oven three at a time and then took them out on a big wooden spatula. It was messy, noisy, and very satisfying. James came over and ordered a pizza, specifying exactly what he wanted. I only grinned. I don't make them, I'm just in charge of making them. You can handle making them yourself. He frowned. I got the impression he was used to being catered to. He had a pretty wife, medium build and a little chubby, and a daughter who looked like a carbon copy of her. Jenny had to explain to them how it worked. The little girl enjoyed looking at the ingredients and making decisions. She was about 11 and the other kids were giving her all sorts of advice. When she was done, her pizza was about four inches tall. We intentionally made the crust small for the kids because experience told us that their eyes would overload their stomachs every time. But even at that size, they often took home leftovers. His wife told him she had already made the pizza and he went back to his duties, impressing his new neighbors with his wealth and business acumen. Few of them actually believed his words. Most tolerated them with a slight smile. Some even argued with him, not caring a bit about his ego. He tried to charm the ladies but made little impression on them. I caught him trying to chat with Sarah and Jenny, and Sarah, noticing my gaze, smirked and lifted her foot slightly, letting me know he was digging in deep. Sarah almost never came to our parties unless it was pizza night. Despite her lifestyle, she loved kids and was the favorite babysitter in our group. Everyone, down to the last child, loved Aunt Sarah. After the party, I asked them what they thought of the new neighbor. Sarah rolled her eyes. That man is a legend in his own mind, especially among women. He wants to make you believe he invented sex and was the only man who knew how to do it. Jenny was a little kinder. Oh, I don't know. He seemed nice enough when he wasn't trying to flirt. Sarah snorted. Jenny, you've been out of the game too long. He worked the party, hitting on every woman who talked to him. Watch out for him. Nothing more was said. I still didn't like him. I got a promotion and was in line for another one in a year or so, if all went according to plan. Jenny still worked retail and still hated it. Two nights and every weekend was killing her and ruining our intimate time. I persuaded her hard to quit her job and start a family. She was starting to seriously consider it. Another cliche? The husband is the last to know. That's not really true. Many people find out after the husband finds out. Process servers, attorneys, judges, private investigators, sometimes police officers and EMT paramedics. Often friends find out, but rarely family. It was the 4th of July, time for the biggest block party of the year. It had undergone changes over the years. It usually started early, and I usually heated up the clay pizza oven. The kids would run around, play, swim in one of the pools, and eat an early dinner. Then a few older teens would pack them off to a movie while the parents let their hair down. It was a pretty good system. It was the first time I couldn't be there. 
there was to be a major hunt and trials that weekend that pretty much determined the champions. Normally, Jimmy or Jerry would do that, but Jerry had the opportunity to go to the beach, and Jimmy already had plans to go with his family to an amusement park for the weekend. All the tickets were already booked and prepaid, so it all fell to me. Jenny didn't like it, but there was nothing I could do about it. We had a pretty serious fight about it. I don't understand why you can't say no. She stood with her arms folded across her chest and looked at me. Honey, please stop. If someone else was available, I wouldn't go. This is important to my father, important to his bottom line. If this new bitch proves herself, it could mean big money in the future. If your mom needed help, I'd be just as quick to say yes, and I'm sure you would too. I've cut back a lot this year, two-thirds less than in previous years. I'll be back as soon as it's over. Can we stop fighting about this? Sarah already said she'd come over and help with the pizza. You won't be alone. If you're not here, I might as well be alone too. She snorted, dashed into the house and slammed the door shut. She didn't speak to me at all that morning I left. Even Sarah could tell she was angry. What's wrong with her? She's got a bug up her ass because I have to go to this trial. We haven't been getting along very well lately. Her job is killing her. I wish she'd quit. We'd both be happier. She put her hand on my arm. I'll talk to her. It might be good for her to be without you for a day or two so she can fully realize what she's missing. Maybe when you get back, you can start working on a new niece or nephew for me. I hugged her. Have I ever told you how lucky we are to have you as a friend? And while we're on the subject, when are you going to give up this lesbian lifestyle and give us a nephew or niece to spoil them with? Time is running out, sweetheart. A wistful expression appeared on her face. I hear that, Sammy. There's very little choice. Who would want to marry a woman like me? Once my past comes up, they'll disappear like fog on a sunny day. I squeezed her tightly in my arms. Listen to me, Sarah Parker. A man, any man, would be lucky to have you. They should be looking to the future, not the past. As far as I know, you've never misled anyone or made unfulfilled promises. If they have any sense, the joy you will bring them will far outweigh the shadows of the past. She cried a little on my shoulder while Jenny stood frowning. Aren't I at least entitled to a goodbye kiss? It was like hugging a statue and she still hadn't offered a kiss. For the first time, I felt a little angry. We were going to have a long talk when I got back. I arrived at the test site a little early, greeted those who were already there, and laughed at the familiar jokes. Even though I was from the same background as them, I went to college and got a job. My nickname was Slick, short for City Slicker. When I first put GPS monitors on my dog's collars, they resented it. But after I started showing up an hour or two early with all my dogs, they stopped laughing. Losing a dog was a real possibility. Sometimes they were never found, or at least it took hours to find them. They decided that change was a good thing. Now all participants usually spend time making sure no one else is on their wavelength. We had to take turns with one guy tuning his own. He would forget to set his home base coordinates, so he always knew where he was, but didn't know how to get back to where he started. I was surprised to see Jerry, my nephew. I thought you were going to the beach. He ruffled Amanda Lee Seven's ears. Yeah. My friend's mom had some business come up, so we're waiting until Monday to go there. I was supposed to call, but I only found out about it an hour ago. You can drive home if you want. I'll take it. Thanks, Jerry, I probably will. I think I'll stick around until Dad shows up. Maybe help with the presentations. I actually judged the beginning groups on presentations with my father. There was no conflict of interest because there were no entries from our kennel. I chatted with my dad and left. I'll be home just after dark so I can enjoy the adult festivities. Jenny should be happy, I thought on the way home. We can spend the rest of the weekend together, maybe start on the baby. It was a little before nine when I pulled up in front of the house. I didn't bother unloading the car, just popped inside for a quick change of clothes. The adult party was being held at the Mitchell house. It was the biggest party in the neighborhood. I'm sure James had his wife laboring for weeks to make everything perfect. I lived six houses down, on a different street, and after traversing several backyards, it was easier to walk than drive. The houses stood on a hill, each a little lower than the other, which made for interesting views if you kept the blinds open. I rounded the back of the neighboring house and grinned. 
someone had decided to throw a little party. The blinds were open and the window was at eye level. It was the Joneses' house. I could see people crowding around the Mitchells. Those guys were pretty brave, and anyone could walk by. Being a man, I threw a few glances at them as I walked by. I was almost to the house when I stopped. The man's name was James Mitchell, and I was pretty sure the slender woman was not his chubby little wife. I frowned. We'd lost two families the year before when one wife caught her husband with a neighbor. Two divorces, two houses up for sale. I stopped and looked closely, hoping to identify the woman. He rolled over and pulled her to him. It was Jenny. My vision blurred and I lost touch with reality. Shaking my head to clear it, I looked at her again. It was definitely her, and she looked like she was having a hell of a hard time. I thought about jumping up. I thought about making a scene. I thought about leaving until I calmed down. As I tried to think rationally, the temper tantrum I'd been trying to contain for years began to build. I had to force myself to turn away and walk back towards the house. I stopped twice on the way trying to drive the anger back up. I got in my car and thought for a second. To hell with all of this, I yelled inside the truck. Slamming the door shut, I grabbed my gun and ran towards the house, keeping in the shadows. I couldn't believe they were still here. Hadn't anyone missed them? I pulled the trigger. I heard yelling and saw people looking in my direction, so I ran in the opposite direction from the house, circling back to my truck. I threw everything in the trunk and slowly stretched out, heading back to the hunting spot. On the way out of town, I encountered no cops or emergency vehicles. Ninety minutes later, I was on the hunt, inside the tent. I was shaking. Shit. I'm going to jail. Shit, shit, shit! The rage and adrenaline had dried up and I was confused and saddened. I hope I didn't hurt her too badly. Rat shot is tiny pellets, unlikely to kill someone, but it sure hurt. It was a long night and I didn't sleep. I checked around, no one knew I had left. As far as they knew, I went to get food. I went to the local supermarket and bought every container of fried chicken they had. Surely someone will remember that I was there. Jerry was in the woods and my dad was out with friends on a drinking binge. I had the perfect alibi, assuming none of the neighbors saw me. Before I left, I lent Jerry a .22 caliber pistol. It wasn't registered and couldn't be traced. I told Jerry not to brag because an unregistered gun could get him in trouble. To say I was worried as I pulled up to my house would be an understatement. Jenny's car was parked in the driveway, but the house was empty. On the kitchen table was a note written in large block letters. Call me as soon as you get home. It's important, Sarah. I took a deep breath and dialed the number. She answered on the first ring. I didn't get a chance to speak. Sammy, you have to get here right away. Something terrible has happened. I went into worried husband mode. What's happened? Where's Jenny? Is she with you? Shut up and get your ass over here right now. I was at her apartment 15 minutes later, determined to play out this little drama. I was tired, anxious, more than a little afraid I was going to jail. She practically dragged me inside and burst into tears as she opened the door. I put my arms around her. Oh shit, I thought to myself. She slumped down on the couch and patted it. There's something I need to tell you. Something you're not going to like. First, I need to tell you that Jenny is fine. It's a little sore, but it's okay. Where is she? What happened? Is she in the hospital? I need answers, Sarah. She looked at me and squeezed my hands tightly. This is going to hurt. I need you to listen to me, okay? Try not to interrupt. Let me have my say. She paused, gathering her thoughts. We were making pizza for the kids. Mitchell came over, ostensibly to check on his daughter. He tried to chat with me, but I quickly blew him off. He turned his attention to Jen, complimenting her and talking trash. She was still mad at you and enjoyed taking it. I got so mad that I accidentally touched his hand with a red-hot pizza pan. He screamed like a little girl and we put ice on it to prevent blisters. I may have been wrong because Jenny hovered over him and he ate the whole thing. He went off to his house to make sure everything was ready for the adults. We fed the kids and then the teenagers who were assigned to sit with the little ones showed up. They took them outside to William's house, you know? The one with the big basement? They had ready-made children's movies that were shown on that monstrosity they call television. I was getting tired of listening. I interrupted her. I'm getting a little long, Sarah. Get to the point. 
I'm going to ask you again to tell me what's going on, or I'm going to call the neighbors, the police, and the hospital. Spit it out. She didn't look me in the eye. Okay. We cleaned up after pizza and walked down the street talking. Jenny found a bar and made herself a stiff drink. Her charming host gave her a big hug and made sure her glass was full. You know how it is at parties. Everyone's hanging around, having fun. I lost her. Like everyone else, I figured she was somewhere in the house or on the terrace. She was practically hissing with anger now. That Mitchell bastard ran out of bourbon, and instead of going to the liquor store, Mandy Jones gave him the house keys, saying she had two bottles at the bar. He promised to replace them and asked Jenny to come with him. Said he didn't feel comfortable going into the house alone. She went. She took a deep breath. That's where it got complicated. Somehow he got her into one of the guest rooms and they started fooling around. I gave her a cold stare. Define fooling around. She hung her head. They slept together. Damn, I didn't want to tell you that. Even though I already knew it, having someone say it to me made it hurt even more. I jumped up. I'm going to destroy that bastard. Sarah was beside me, holding my hand. I'm afraid it's getting worse. Someone has been shooting at them. Don't worry, Jenny wasn't badly hurt, but she's still in the hospital. I paced around the room. My excitement wasn't feigned. Having fun with someone else? Shot up? What the hell has she gotten herself into? Was it Mrs. Mitchell who shot them? No, no, she was at the party. We all heard gunshots, but we thought they were firecrackers. We didn't notice anything until we heard the screams. Mandy found them. They were in her guest room. She called 911. They were taken to the hospital and the police questioned everyone. She lowered her eyes and cried quietly. It's a mess, Sammy. The cops want to talk to you as soon as they can. I sat down again. The tears rolling down my cheeks weren't pretend. She got up and called the police and 10 minutes later, a patrolman was at the door. He noticed the tears, asked a few questions to clarify who I was, and took me to the station. Detective Johnson seemed like a nice guy. He didn't pressure me, didn't accuse me of anything, just wanted to know where I was when it all happened. So I told him. Gave him names and numbers of people who could confirm that I was there. Told him what time I got home about the note from Sarah. I collapsed in the interrogation room. Are you okay? Need anything? He was kind enough to at least ask. Yeah. I need to get about 12 hours of sleep. I need to make sure my wife is okay. And I need answers. No one has ever told me what happened. I cooperated with you. How about you fill in the blanks? To his credit, he looked uncomfortable. There's no easy way to say this. Your wife and Mr. Mitchell were shot through a bedroom window. But it seems nothing life-threatening. They were in a neighbor's house. I think it was spontaneous. Both had blood alcohol levels above the legal limit for driving. I asked the million-dollar question. Do you have any idea who did it? He shook his head. Not the slightest clue. We thought it might have been you, but since you were 60 miles from the scene, in front of witnesses, you were virtually unhurt. We attracted bloodhounds, but everyone in the area spent all day roaming the neighborhood, and the dogs just went around in circles. We brought in a dog that specializes in gunshot trails, but it used so many firecrackers and other fireworks that it was just running around confused. Right now, we're focusing on Mr. Mitchell. It seems the man had a habit of seducing the wives of his neighbors. That's how he ended up in your neighborhood. He had to leave the previous one because of a divorce his neighbor accused him of. He definitely has people who wish him ill. That's all we have for now, but you can be sure we'll talk more. I'm sorry, Mr. Lee. I left the station and drove to the hospital. Jenny drove me. She tried to talk me out of going. Don't do this, Sammy. You'll have a hard time later? I'm sure she didn't mean it. She was drunk, mad at you, and fell under the spell of a predator. I'm sure my eyes were cold as I turned to her. Tell me, Sarah, how can this be okay? I've been drunk since we got married. I've been mad at her a few times, and I've already been molested. I haven't even thought about sleeping with anyone else, except in fantasies. She didn't have an answer for me. I went on my own. I found the right floor and walked down the hallway. It just so happened that I passed the asshole's room first, turned around and walked in. He was dozing and I stood there looking at him. 
My stare must have woken him up. He turned pale and reached for the call button. I grabbed his arm and leaned over him. Free advice. When you get out of here, move. I don't mean in a week or a month or when you sell the house. I mean move right now. I stood up. I hope you get everything you deserve, asshole. Remember our little talk. With that taken care of, I went in search of my loving wife. For lack of a better suspect, the cops came back to me several times. They asked if I had a gun and I opened my safe. My Remington 1100, my Over Under, my Deer Rifle, my Henry 22, my Smith .40 caliber, my Llama .380, they were all checked and returned to me. I was questioned four times. When they asked for one more, I gave them my attorney's number. I never heard from them again. My marriage lasted about four months, like a three-legged dog trying to keep up with a Ferrari before we both mutually gave up. I was consumed with anger over her cheating and guilt over my reaction. She had a wide range of emotions. I came home from hunting and found her gone in a note on the kitchen table. Sammy, I'm sorry. I can't live like this anymore. Even if you still love me, you'll never trust me again. And I hope I'm wrong, but I have a feeling you're the one who shot at us. I called my old company in Oregon, and they had an opening for me. I accepted and was on a plane two hours after you left. I only took what I needed and my mom will be coming in a week or two to pick up everything I left behind that you don't need. I know I should have told you in person, but I'm a coward. I'm sorry again. I was supposed to be what you wanted, but I'm not, at least not anymore. I will always love you. I wish you a good life. Jen. I stood there looking at the note, and although I felt immense sadness, a big part of me was relieved. Our marriage was over when I caught them and pulled the trigger. Before she left, she called Sarah. She arrived two hours later. She read the note, hugged me, and sent me to bed. She stayed with me for three days before I convinced her I could handle it. I discovered that she often talks on the phone when she thinks I can't hear her. I asked her about it. Her face lit up. You were in trouble, so I didn't say anything. I'm engaged. We've been dating for about six months now. He was like me, and we both decided it was time to grow up. We're going to Vegas next month. He's always dreamed of marrying Elvis. I hugged her. That's great, Sarah. What the hell are you doing here? Go home to your man. Tell him I told him how lucky he is. And remind him that if he's rude to you, I have an extensive collection of weapons. She giggled. I will. Half the neighborhood thinks you shot Jenny and the asshole anyway. Maybe that'll keep him in line. The old group threw a party to wish her well and meet her boyfriend. It was held at my house. I didn't like him, but that didn't mean anything. I got another promotion, but I had to move to get it. I didn't mind, there was nothing keeping me here. My new job was a little closer to my dad's house, just on the other side. I still went once a month for testing, just to have something to do. The next year, my dad passed away. Jimmy and Jerry took over the kennel. They liked it better than I did. Jerry moved into the house. The farm was divided into three parts, and I ended up with the lot I wanted. Sixteen acres, mostly woods, some of which went up the side of the mountain. I laid out a road to a small bench and built a small log cabin. By small, I meant about 700 square feet. It was basically a kitchen, living room, a small bathroom on the main floor, and a small bedroom upstairs. It was all the space I needed. I did almost all of the work myself, with the help of my family, paying for electricians and roofers. I dated but never got anything serious, too afraid of my temper. Once in a while I visited my old friends and a few times I rented out the cabin on loan. I heard that Jenny had married and had two children. As far as I know, she never went back except to close on her mother's house when she passed away. Sarah was married for two years before it broke up. Apparently he wasn't as ready to give up his lifestyle as he thought he was. She was devastated. She disappeared from his life for another year. One day I heard a knock on the door. It was Sarah. She looked aged, tired, and sad. In her hands, she held a blue tick puppy. Hi, Sammy. Can we come in? I think she's house trained. I was in the cabin. I was seriously considering moving there permanently. I liked the privacy and this place had everything I needed. How did you know I was here? Jimmy told me. When did you change your room? I'd been harassed for six months by some junkie who'd mistaken my number for another. I stopped answering my phone and she started texting me, 
offering me lucrative deals on different types of drugs. Eventually, I got so sick of it that I showed the text message to a sheriff's deputy. He took my phone for three hours and copied everything. He texted her to arrange a purchase, bought from her, and tracked her to a major supplier. He was the one who advised me to change my number in case someone tried to trace it to get revenge. I told her the story of my adventure in the drug trade. She laughed, saying it could only happen to me. I converted my open kitchen to a clay oven, and we made pizza and drank some wine. I asked her about the dog. I stopped by the kennel to try to find you. One of your buddies was trying to give this baby away. He said if he couldn't find a home for her, he'd give her to a shelter. I couldn't stand the thought that she might not be adopted, so I took her in. We quickly found out that she was not housebroken. It was getting late. I made a fold-out couch for her and said goodnight. When I woke up around 3 o'clock, I found her in my bed, snuggled up against my back. I stirred, she hugged me tighter, and I relaxed and fell asleep. The next morning, nothing was said. She was up before me, fiddling around in my small kitchen making breakfast. I stomped over and she bought me coffee and kissed me on the cheek. We walked through the woods and I showed her my solar panels that powered the cabin. It was pretty cheap for such a small house, and I had a gasoline generator for backup power. The puppy trotted in front of us until he got tired, and then Sarah carried him back to the shack. We went out to eat hamburgers, and then we ate popcorn and watched some lilting romance she'd picked out. Every now and then I noticed her snorting. Something was bothering her. I was patient. She would tell me when she was ready. When it was time to go to bed, she looked at me. Can I go upstairs with you, or should I wait until you're asleep? I'll trade a spot in bed for an explanation. She looked lost and alone. If you let me cuddle with you tonight, I'll tell you all about it in the morning. Deal, but I'll get the left side today. I had to go to work the next day, so I slipped out of bed when the alarm clock rang, trying not to wake her. I let the puppy out of his cage to respond to the call of nature and quietly placed him on the bed. He licked her hands and then went back to sleep. When I got home, she was in the yard playing with the puppy. She hugged me happily and told me that dinner would be ready in half an hour. We had a very good meal. I thanked her for it and she blushed. The roof of the cabin stretched out in front of the house and I had a lovely porch with a couple of rocking chairs on it. We took our tea outside to admire the sunset. We sat in friendly silence, both of us swaying slightly. She spoke so softly that I almost let her words pass my ears. Sammy, can I stay here for a while? I continued to sway, thinking about it. As long as you want, honey. I can go back to my apartment and you can... She shook her head violently. No. I meant, can I live with you for a while? Wherever you are, here or in your apartment. I just don't want to be alone right now. I needed to know. Okay, you can stay as long as you want. You know you have to tell me why, right? She nodded, hesitating. Sammy, have you ever reached a point in your life where you realize that all your plans are just dust? That's exactly where I am right now. I was happy in college and the first few years after college. I enjoyed my party life and didn't care what people thought of me. I never lied or hurt anyone. I saw all of our friends getting married and realized I wasn't ready. A few more years went by and all of our married friends started to drift apart. It was sad and confirmed my decision. Then I was diagnosed with an STD. Not one of the serious, life-changing ones, but it still scared me. I looked at Ron and his wife and you and Jen and wanted what you had. I don't know if you remember, but one day, before you two broke up, I told you I was thinking about changing my life. And I did. By then, you and Jen were getting ready to divorce, and I decided to be really sure. I thought everyone should love as much as you two did, and when everything fell apart, it made me think. But I found a guy. I think I fell in love with him because he reminded me of you in some ways. He was wonderful during our courtship and the first year we were married. I told him about my past, and he told me about his. He and his first wife were swingers. His marriage failed because of it, and he swore he was done with that lifestyle. But deep down, he missed it. The second year, he introduced me to some of his old friends. They seemed nice enough to me. We went to a few parties, and I started to notice a pattern. At one party, I was molested until I made him drive me home. It was the worst fight of our lives. I told him I wasn't interested, and that I'd better be enough for him if he wanted to stay married. He swore that he would have no more contact with them except for walks, ball games, and the like. I believed him for about four months, 
until he was foolish enough to tell me he was going to a baseball game and would be home very late. The downside to that was that it was November, and no one plays baseball in November. I followed him to the house of one of his swinger friends. I sat in the car for half an hour and then went inside. They had already started coming in. There was a lot of kissing and groping. Some were already getting ready to undress. I asked where my husband was and headed for the bedroom, shedding my clothes as I went. When I opened the door, I was already naked with four or five guys following me. He looked up from the bed he shared with two women, saw me naked and smiled. Hi, sweetheart. Do you want to join us? No, bastard, I'm not joining you. I just wanted you to take one last look at what you threw away. They pushed me out of the house before I could cause any more trouble. He never came home. The divorce didn't come until four and a half months later. Then my company was bought out by a competitor and shut down. So here I was, 32 years old, no man, no job, no hope. I just needed a change of scenery. I couldn't afford an apartment anymore. I put my stuff in storage, packed my bags, and here I was. I was on my way home to see my mom, and I figured since I was so close, I'd stop and see you. I love this place, and more importantly, I love you. No, that's not right. I love you. Not in the forever and happily ever after sense, but in the sense that I could say anything to you, and you wouldn't judge me. You've always given me friendship and respect, which not many people, especially guys, have done for me. So can I stay here for a while? What was I supposed to do? Say no to her. So she stayed. She named the puppy Tickles. Why did you name her that? I asked one day as she held her in her arms. Well, I didn't know what to call her. Everyone tends to call them Blue, but I couldn't do it. Since the last part of the word Blue Tick is Tick, I named her Tickles. Isn't that a cute name, baby girl? She stroked her tummy and cooed to her at the end. You're going to be a great mom. It came out of my mouth before I could think. She froze. A look of sadness appeared on her face. I hope so if I ever get the chance. We were already 32, and her window was rapidly closing. There was no future for us. She knew it, I knew it, but that was just the way it was. She was a wonderful lover, better than anyone I'd ever been with. Our lovemaking was intense. But while we had feelings for each other, neither of us made plans. She lived with me for eight months. I got her a job at my company. It didn't pay as much as she was used to, but it gave her something to do. She quickly made friends and started having the occasional girls' night out. One day she came home after a night out and practically raped me. She did the same thing the next morning. When we were done, she sat up in bed and a tear ran down her cheek. What's wrong, baby? I'm going to sleep on the couch for a while, Sammy. That was our last time together. I met someone, a guy from the bar we girls go to. He's been there a few times, but he's never proposed to me. Carol knew him and brought him over so we'd have someone to dance with. I kissed him last night at the end of the dance. It was electric. I realized it was time to move on. I can't sleep with you and think about finding someone else. Please tell me you understand. I looked at her gorgeous body with gratitude and sadness before pulling her to me. The time has come. We both knew it would happen sooner or later. I hope this guy is right for you. Just be careful. Two more cliches I don't like. They lived happily ever after. Time heals all wounds. Three years passed and I still miss Jenny. She had remarried and had two kids. I hope things work out for them. Sarah married the guy from the bar. He seemed like a nice man. She told him about her past when they started a serious relationship. Her heart melted when he admitted that he had only had two women before her, and he was looking forward to what she could teach him. She said she plans to give him lessons for the rest of their lives. She gave birth to their first son at the age of 35 and their second son at 37. Every day I lived with regret. I should have forgiven her. We would probably still be together. Memories of it kept me from getting involved in a relationship. I was afraid of my temper. Now you know how it feels, asshole. I dated but never got close to him. My favorite cliche of all time. Love conquers all. I joined a local gym. I worked out but went to mostly yoga and tai chi. It helped me focus and keep my mind in check. I spent most of the year in therapy. It helped. I learned to control my temper and not be so judgmental. I won't say it was easy. 
I still have to push back sometimes. They say love comes to you when you least expect it. I know, another cliche. She was new to yoga and got into the wrong class. She got into an intermediate class, not a beginner class. She struggled to stay on her feet, got confused, and ended up falling on top of me. This embarrassed her to the core. I helped her up and she ran out of the classroom. The next day she was standing in the hallway looking unsure. When she saw me, she blushed. I smiled at her. It gets easier, you know. Don't give up. That broke the ice. We chatted before class and she was waiting for me at the end. She faltered before she blurted out. Would you like some coffee? The statement came out as she colored various shades of red. It took three dates before she stopped blushing, and two more before I got a kiss. It was worth the wait. She saw my face when we exchanged names. Jenny Cooper. What? My ex-girlfriend's name was Jenny. Oh. By the seventh date, I realized it was probably the one. She had a little boy. He was three years old. Her husband had gotten a better offer and left her. She had no idea where he was. The baby was her life, and our dates depended on her ability to find a babysitter. After the third time she had to cancel, I showed up at her door. Get dressed. Get your son dressed. We're going out to dinner. If we keep going, I'm going to have to meet him. Emotions ran one after another across her face until she smiled. Come in, I won't be long. How should I dress? We're just going to have dinner. Jeans will be fine. And so I sat in her living room, listening intently while her son tried to explain something about a game he was playing on his toy computer. By the time she came out, we had become fast friends. She was 27. She had chosen a restaurant, a small diner, and everyone knew her name. Jason was putting fries on his plate while we talked. We ended up going to the movies and watched a Pixar movie, which Jason didn't understand, but enjoyed immensely. I had a great time. When I took them home, he was like a light. She invited me into the house while she put him to bed. Sarah had to leave Tickles behind. Her new man was allergic to animal hair. She cried as if she had lost a baby. She immediately bonded with Jason, whining if I wouldn't let her play with him. Soon she was sleeping with him. Jenny was concerned. Don't be, I said. She adopted him. She'll make sure he's safe. Jenny smiled that secret smile that women have. Sarah was right, you know. Right about what, baby? She said you were the best lover she'd ever had. Big enough, but not too big, and you knew how to use it. She said it didn't really matter. What mattered was that you gave yourself completely to the pleasure, not caring about your needs. She said a woman could feel it, and she was right. I thought about it for a while and decided it wasn't so bad. Two months later, I threw a little pizza party. My brother Jimmy, my nephew Jerry, their families. Sarah and her husband and baby, Jenny's parents, a few neighbors with families. My sister even showed up on rare occasions. The kids were chasing fireflies and my parents were sitting in lawn chairs enjoying the evening. Jenny sat as close as she could and watched Tickles chase Jason and the rest of the kids as they played. Do you like it here, Jen? I'm not really sure what you mean, she replied, frowning slightly. I did my best to keep my face straight. It's a simple question, but let me clarify. Can you imagine yourself living here? We'll have to add a couple rooms, one for Jason and then hopefully a little girl. But I like it here. I don't want to move. So it's up to you, Jen. I already talked to Jason, and he's fine with Tickles sleeping in his room. So how would you feel about living here as my wife? I held out the ring to her. She went pale and then literally snatched the ring out of my hands. That pretty much ruined the party. Her scream caught the girl's attention, and then I was literally thrown off my chair. The guys huddled around me. Congratulations were being offered. I pulled out the peach brandy I kept with me for special occasions, and a toast was shared by everyone. We decided not to annex the cabin and built a house below. The cabin became our retreat and later served as our son's sleepover base. When our little daughter came along, things got more complicated, but she ended up staying with her sleepovers, too. Her mom helped her make things more girl-friendly. When Jason was going through puberty, I almost had a nervous breakdown when J2 Jenny Jr. had her parties, but they were good kids. Jen was 28 when we got married and I was 37. I worried about it for a while, knowing I would probably leave before she did, 
but stopped when I realized she was the glue that held our family together, and she would take care of the family. Before we got married, I told her everything. About my bad character, what I did to the first Jenny, everything. She thought about it for a bit, then smiled and said she was glad she didn't know me then. Good guys finish first, she said. We all get what we deserve. God, don't you just love cliches? Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.